Frederick March and Florence Eldridge in One Foot in Heaven on the Cavalcade of America, presented by DuPont, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Clayton Collier. Tonight, the Cavalcade of America, through special arrangement with Warner Brothers Studios, is happy to present the first radio performance of one of the great screenplays of our time, One Foot in Heaven. It is a story of a man of deep faith, told with fine humor and great humanity, a story of the truest ideals of America, a picture which should be seen by every American today. Tonight, the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by DuPont, presents Frederick March in his original screen role and Florence Eldridge in the role created by Martha Scott in One Foot in Heaven. Good morning, Doc. Hello, Parson. How's the business of pulling folks to heaven? <laughs> How's the business of pulling teeth? My patients may howl, but they don't sing hymns. Dr. Horrigan, you're a thorn in my side, and I admit it. What have you got against religion? It just doesn't make sense, all this business about saving souls. How do you know you have a soul? I feel it. You feel it? That means you touch it. No, 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 no. I didn't mean that. Well, can you see it? No. Can you smell it? No. Can you taste it? No. Can you hear it? No. Well, then, all your senses are against you. You have no soul. Dr. Horrigan, as a dentist, you must have had many a patient with a toothache. Ever had one yourself? Certainly. Did you touch it? Hmm? Did you see it? No. Did you smell it, taste it, hear it? No. All your senses are against you. You never had a toothache. That's just sophistry. Pretty clever, though. But... Tell me, what have you really got for religion? Everything, seems to me. The man's protection, his bulwark against trouble. Man can do with a little aid from God to keep him on an even keel. I think Christian morals are the only thing that can save him in the world. Moreover, Christianity is fun. It's a way of life that's man's greatest joy and satisfaction. The end of all living, now and forever. I see. One foot on earth and one foot already in heaven. <laughs> Don't scoff, Doctor. All I ask is that you respect Christ as a teacher. I'll respect him as the son of God and we'll both be happy. If I didn't have to get home and finish writing Sunday's sermon, I'd uh, stay here until I had you converted. <laughs> And so I say unto you, if a man keep this faith before him al always, then he will walk in the sight of... If a man keep his faith, then he will walk in the sight of God. And every man shall... Be... He... Mother! Mother, where are you? Goodness, will you make more noise than the engine? Oh, can you tell me why in all creation this parsonage should have been built next to a firehouse? Or even vice versa? Will, it's something I've been meaning to talk to you about. It's high time the baby was christened. You know yourself it is. So I thought this Sunday... Oh, Will, you aren't listening. Mother, if those bells don't stop pretty soon, I won't be responsible for myself, that's all. Would you deny your child a Christian name? Would you, Will? Who's denying my child a Christian name? What are you talking about? Will you christen the baby or won't you? You know that's not the issue, dear. It's simply that I will not have my son named plain William Spence. He's got a right to a middle name. He wouldn't be plain William Spence. He'd be William Spence Jr. Jr. That's a sissy name. Now take, for example, William Fraser Spence. There's really a name for you. No, Father, I've told you before, I do not like the name Fraser. Oh, isn't it time, dear, to start uh, fixing supper? There'll be no supper fixed in this house until this is settled. I never thought you'd take such an uncharitable advantage of me. Very well, Mother. I'll give in. I'll name the baby. This Sunday? This Sunday. Oh, thank goodness that's settled. I'll fix you a real good supper, Will. 
a real good supper. All those who have babies to be baptized, please step forward. Name, please. John Henry Appleby. John Henry Appleby, I baptize thee in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The name, please. William Spence, Jr. William Fraser Spence, I baptize thee in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. you uh, might like some ice cream. I brought some home. Oh, ice cream. Mm -hmm. How is uh, baby? Baby? Yeah, baby. Fraser is having his afternoon nap. Fraser. Fraser. Bless you, Mother. Bless you. You wanted it real bad, didn't you, Father? Yes, I did. Oh, uh oh. There comes the rain on that leaky roof. I hope you aren't using all the pans for dinner. Hotzel? Yes, Father. Uh, Hotzel, come and uh, get the pan to put in the bedroom. All right, Father. I'll put the pans in the study in the hall. I'll take care of the parlor. You better open your ice cream, dear. Oh, yes, of course. Oh, strawberry. Your favorite kind. Mother, there are nine holes in this roof. Nine. I've just counted them. Well, that makes it official. There's our, our whole parish sitting in warm, comfortable houses, and we can't even find a dry spot in ours. It's more than any man can stand. Well, Will, every man has his cross. Why are you staring at me like that? Because I'm seeing you for the first time. What an absurd thing to say. You've seen me every day since I was 20. I'm seeing you as you are, Hope. The wife of a parson. I'm remembering the trials you've had to put up with, the series of parsonages you had to live in, each home dingier than the other, and the cast-off furniture, and clothes out of missionary barrels. I'm remembering your work in the church and the Sunday school, the clubs and societies, the Committee for the Alleviation of the Plight of the Poor, each a full-time job in itself. And still you found time to cook and mend and scrub for a family, rear children, comfort a husband. And you've borne all this with the serenity of a Madonna. I've been your wife, Will. What the years have brought you, they've brought to me. The days I've lived have been beautiful ones, because you've been part of them. We don't take much time out to say these things. Perhaps we should. Bless you, Mother. Don't you remember what I said the day you asked me to marry you? The day you offered me your kingdom? And treat me not. To leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God, my God. Mother, you've always hankered after a yellow kitchen and a frigid air, now haven't you? Well, well, I... Here, taste the stew. Hmm? Oh, yeah, good, good. All right, Mother, you're going to have it. I'm going to build a new church. Everyone's building new homes and stores. And while they're about it, they can build something for God. I hope you stay in this mood. It's time they woke up. I'll wager it isn't leaking in Preston Thurston's home or Mrs. Sandow's. You can bet your boots it isn't. Yes, sir, Mother? You're going to have the home you've always dreamed about. And I'm going to have my church.
You are listening to One Foot in Heaven, based on Warner Brothers' great new picture. Our stars tonight are Frederick March and Florence Eldridge on the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by DuPont, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. As the next scene opens, Pastor Spence is facing the building committee. When I suggested that the uh, building committee meet here, I had in mind that while we're thinking about a new church, we can take a good look at the old one, <laughs> if we can stand it. My grandfather designed this church and served its purpose. A lot of souls have been saved in this church. Brother Spence, will you kindly explain to me why in these proposed plans you've changed the location of the choir loft? Well, is the uh, choir moved, Brother Thurston? You know very well it is. It's almost hidden. No one will be able to see my wife. Well, when Brother they... Thurston, I've always thought that the function of a choir was to be heard rather than seen. Have you thought what it would mean if I withdrew my support from this project? Yes, we know. None of your cronies would contribute either. There is certainly not going to be any choir loft or any church unless this whole set of plans is radically changed. And I suggest we adjourn for the... Oh, uh, now, just a moment, idea. gentlemen. Yeah, now, Mr. Day, Day, Brother Potter, you... If, I can... Well, Bill, do you believe in what you told them about wanting a church that's both beautiful and spiritual? Why, oh, of course I do, John. And thanks for sticking by me, as you always do. Well, then, fight for it. If you'd lick Thurston on this choir issue, you'd have him licked for all time. Oh, I've been worrying about that choir for a long time. Oh, it's a disgrace. All his family and all his friends smack dab up there in the middle of the whole shebang every Sunday, carrying on like prima donna opera stars. There isn't a voice in that whole choir that didn't crack about the year 1900. I jolly. I put up with it long enough. All right, if they want to fight, they'll have a fight. Have you a plan? John, I suggest you come to church on Children's Day. Yes. Well, I suggest you come to church next Sunday on Children's Day. There is uh, something I want to place before the congregation. Our loyal choir has had no rest for nearly 12 years. That, uh, well, that is right, isn't it, uh, Sister Thurston? Uh, 13 years, Brother Stan. Yes, 13 years. That is service deserving of reward. Why don't you good singers take a vacation this summer? In the meantime, we'll, we'll let the children provide the music for the church. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. I accept that applause as a tribute to our loyal choir. Over the summer, we'll let you rest. The children will carry on, starting now. All right, children. Brother Spence, a beautiful sound. Thank you, Sister Carey. Hello, Bill. Hello, uh, John. I can't tell you when I've enjoyed a choir so much. I'm glad you like it, John. But, uh, say, from one friend to another, yeah? did you get a look at Mr. Thurston's face and Mrs. Thurston? Yes, John, I did. Uh-oh, here comes trouble now. My wife and I would like a word with you, Brother Spence. Yes, Brother Thurston? I have never been so insulted in my life. I presume you're proud of yourself. Well, I... I was proud of the children. The whole thing was a put-up job, and I know it. Yes, Brother Thurston, I guess we'd have to say it was a put-up job. For years, I've let you run the choir as you wanted. And many's the Sunday I've gone home with a headache. You seem to forget that all church appointments, including music, are made by me. That is a condition which no longer exists in this church. In that case, this church is no longer big enough for you and me. Then, Mr. Thurston, I can only accept your resignation. 
with thanks for your many years of service. Don't be too sure that it's I who go. You're letting yourself in for trouble, Reverend, when you start fooling with me. You're letting yourself in for trouble. Hartzell, uh, Hartzell, what, uh, what are you doing home this time of day? Why aren't you in school? Well, I, I, father, I've been expelled. Mr. Haskins called me into the principal's office and said I was dismissed. Well, why? What for? Well, what was it that editorial you wrote in the school paper? Oh, no, sir. No, Mr. Haskins said I've done a good job with the paper. And he said they were counting on me in the orchestra now, concert. Hartzell, I'm and... doing my best, please. But if you keep telling me what it's not, we'll never get any place. So just skip all the rest and tell me what it is. Well, do you know Elsie Mayfield, Father? Mayfield, Mayfield. Oh, uh, Congregationalist family, aren't they? Uh, her father's an electrician. I, I, I don't know whether he's a Congregationalist or not. Well, Elsie was in my Latin class, but she isn't anymore. Well, why isn't Elsie Mayfield in your Latin class anymore? Her family's moved to San Francisco. Well, it seems entirely reasonable to me that if her family has moved to San Francisco, Elsie would no longer be in your Latin class. Uh, son, I'm going to lose my patience in a minute. Well, Mr. Haskin said it's on my account. The family moved away. Uh, do I have to say anything more, Father? No, no. I want you to answer me a question. If ever in your life you lied to me, don't do it now. If you are responsible, I'll stand behind you. But if you're not responsible, someone is going to hear from me. Are you or are you not guilty? No, sir. I'm not. All right. I believe you. I believe you, Archie. Mr. Haskins, as principal of this school, are you willing to take the responsibility for attaching this stigma to a boy on the strength of rumor? Well, naturally, I conducted a thorough investigation before I act. I'll appreciate it if you'll tell me where it led you. If you don't, I'll turn this town upside down. Well, I... Uh... I'll be happy to tell you all that I know. <clears throat> uh, our superintendent of schools got the story from Mr. Moody. Well, Mr. Moody had heard it from Mr. Simmons, who was told by Sister Goldthwaite. The Mr. Goldthwaite picked it up at the bank, from whom he didn't recall. He'd better recall. <laughs> You'd be surprised, Brother Spence, all the blind alleys I've been up these past few days. <clears throat> I, uh, I went to see uh, Dorothy Ledbetter, and she had gone to tea one afternoon at Lulu Digby's, and she... D wait, did, did you say Lulu Digby? Yes. Uh, Dorothy had gotten the story there under the promise never to divulge the source. See? Well, the Queen's sisters met that same evening, and... Perhaps she had betrayed the confidence. She, she wasn't quite sure. Lulu Digby. One more step and we arrive at Mrs. Preston Thurston. Well, I hope those people are happy. They've done a very good job of ruining a young boy's life. <laughs> Mother, there's a, there's a pastorate vacant in California. The bishop wants to know if I'd be interested in moving. Moving? Yes. Oh, you don't mean a word you're saying. You're not going to quit just because of that building committee. You don't fool me, William Spence, not for a moment. Where is that family moved to, Mother, that uh, Mayfield family? The Mayfield family? Yes. Why, I think... San Francisco, wasn't it? Yes, San Francisco. You know, sometimes it's very hard to keep up with you, Will. You're right, dear. I, I can't quit in the middle of a fight. But I do think a little trip out to look the church over wouldn't hurt. I don't think a little trip out to San Francisco would hurt at all. Well, 
Well, Mrs. Thurston, what do you suppose our dear pastor is going to do now that he's back in town? Well, if you ask me, Mrs. Sandow, he'll be begging the choir to come back. I guess he's learned his lesson. I don't care whether she wants to see me or not. I'm going in. Mrs. Thurston? My brother Spence. How do you do? Good afternoon. Mrs. Thurston, thank God I'm a Christian or I'd kill you. Dr. Spence, what on earth has come over you? You cooked up a fine scheme to get me out of the church, didn't you? Why, but I... you forgot one thing, Mrs. Thurston. A preacher stops being a preacher and starts being a father when his son is attacked. I, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm going to tell from my pulpit what you and your crowd have done and shame you publicly. You and your husband and your brothers-in-law and the whole scheming crowd of them. The Mayfields moved to San Francisco only because the father got a better job. And believe me, I know. I went to San Francisco and found out. Brother Spence, but I... Brother Spence... Why, you don't deserve to live, any of you. The only reason you don't die is, is because the good Lord wouldn't know what to do with you. Why? Well, you, you aren't really going I'm to... I'm going to make you suffer the way... No. No, I'm not. With a great deal of help from the Thurston family, I'm going to build a new church. Good afternoon, ladies. <laughs> Well, uh, Brother Thurston, I, I gather from the look on your face that your wife has already telephoned you. Why, uh, <laughs> yes, she... I, I, uh, Brother Spence, I'll do anything you want. I'll never oppose you again. We made a great mistake. Oh, no, no, Brother Thurston. The Lord needs a voice to say no in his church as often as he needs one to say yes. He's relying on you for the loudest no in the church. I'm afraid I've been mighty wrong, mighty wrong, Brother Well, Spence. so are we all sometimes. <laughs> when I think of some of the instruments through which God has to operate, it's a wonder his work is done at all. Oh, by the way, Brother Thurston, there'll be a meeting tonight of the building committee. <laughs> Everyone will be mighty glad to hear about that $85,000 you contributed. Eighty-five. <laughs> I, I'll be there, Pastor. You can depend on me. I'll be there. Oh, Will, I didn't know I could be so excited. You've done a wonderful job. The church is beyond anything we dream. Well, the parsonage isn't so bad either, Mother, hmm? A bright yellow kitchen, a new refrigerator. Oh, well, isn't it all too wonderful? Yes, yes. Very, very wonderful. You know, Mother, the next church I build is going to have some outdoor tennis courts. The next church? Hmm? The next church? Uh, dear, I've uh, just had a letter from the bishop. There's a little church out in Iowa. It's, uh, well, it's in trouble, Mother. Oh, Will. Of course, it's up to you, dear. I... How long ago did you hear from the bishop? Well, about uh, three weeks ago. Three weeks? Mm -hmm. Well, you've made up your mind then. Well, Mother, what, uh, what do you say? Why, what I've always said. Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return... From following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. Thy people shall be my people. Thy God, my God. Mother, bless you. Bless you, Mother. Loan me a handkerchief, Will. <laughs> well, there's, there's one thing, Mother. The, uh, the bishop says the church is not next to the firehouse. Thank you, Frederick March and Florence Eldridge. Ladies and gentlemen, in a moment, our stars will return to the microphone, and together with them, we'd like you to meet a man who was invaluable in the filming of One Foot in Heaven. But first, we have some news. This morning at Martinsville, Virginia, the doors of a brand new manufacturing plant opened, and the first of a row of huge, specially designed machines made its initial run. It makes nylon yarn, this machine, and that's what the new DuPont plant at Martinsville will be making from today on. Nylon. Three months ago, with raw silk earmarked for defense purposes, hosiery mills of necessity became more dependent on other fibers. So it isn't too much to say that this new DuPont nylon plant will make the problem brought on by the silk shortage less critical for the hosiery and other textile industries and their workers. 
After a training period at the company's original nylon plant at Seaford, Delaware, skilled DuPont operators are now on duty at the new plant. In all, about a thousand employees will be needed at Martinsville, bringing the total number of jobs created directly through the production of nylon yarn to more than 3,500. And in addition, of course, nylon has saved the jobs of many thousands of workers employed in hosiery and textile mills. Present plans are to devote the first production of the new nylon plant to hosiery yarn for women's stockings. In the early part of next year, more nylon stockings should begin to reach the counters of retail stores. You can get some idea of the size of this new plant making nylon yarn from the fact that its electrical power capacity is 15,000 kilowatts, enough to furnish electricity to a city of 50,000 population. The Martinsville plant is an excellent demonstration in steel, concrete, and brick of the technical know-how for which DuPont is so widely known. The plant was designed and built in 12 months. Actual construction has taken only 10 months despite the fact that the main completely air-conditioned factory building is two city blocks long and varies in height from one to six stories. And that is only the manufacturing building itself. Inside its walls, when installation of all equipment is completed, there will be an intricate array of special machines, chief of which is a battery of 16 nylon spinning machines, capable of producing more than a million miles of nylon yarn every day. Each spinning machine has 10,000 parts is 50 feet long and three stories tall and weighs 95,000 pounds. And these giants are precision machines made to spin delicate filaments less than one thousandth of an inch in diameter, a feat comparable to a locomotive turning out spider webs. Nylon itself, for that matter, is an example of such know-how that has rarely, if ever, been equaled in the history of American industry. Nylon has passed from the test tube stage of development to full-scale production faster than any other major invention of modern times, under the guidance of the DuPont chemists who bring you better things for better living through chemistry. And now we'd like you to meet our stars, Mr. March and Miss Eldridge. I would like to thank you both on behalf of the DuPont company and all of us who work on the program for your performances on our show tonight. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Miss Collier. Thank you very much. May I say for Miss Eldridge and myself that it was a very real privilege for us to appear with the Cavalcade players in presenting this splendid American story. Now, Mr. Collier, I'd like our radio audience to meet a man you spoke of a moment ago, a man who has become a very good friend of mine. He supervised the technical direction of the film, and without his help, one foot in heaven it wouldn't be the picture that we feel it is the Reverend Dr. Norman Vincent Peale of the Marble Collegiate Church in New York City. Well, Brother March, it's good to see you again. I certainly enjoyed working with you and Martha Scott in Hollywood this summer. Thank you, Doctor. And let me congratulate you, Miss Eldridge, for your gracious performance tonight. Thank you, Doctor. You know, I'm anxious to hear, and I'm sure our radio audience is too, what you think of One Foot in Heaven as radio conceived it. I liked it. It seems to me that Cavalcade has skillfully captured the great humanity and courage of the picture itself. I felt again as I listened that one foot in heaven, with its timeliness and power, reveals the strength of America today. For this reason, I am happy that DuPont has given the radio audience a preview of this beautiful story. Thank you, Dr. Peel, and we'd like you and Miss Eldridge and Mr. March to know that we hope this new Warner Brothers picture will enjoy the success it so richly deserves as it is shown throughout the country. Next week, the Cavalcade of America will present Henry Fonda, starring in his romantic and thrilling role of Gil Martin in Drums Along the Mohawk. Our radio adaptation of this great 20th century Fox motion picture is based on the best-selling novel of the same name by Walter D. Edmond. The orchestra and the original musical score are under the direction of Don Vuri. Cavalcade would like to thank the New York Theatre Guild for interrupting rehearsals of its new play, Hope for Harvest, in which Frederick March and Florence Eldridge will soon appear on Broadway in order that we might...